so that everybody can interact with our uh, high-level guests here. So without further ado, I think I'll start. Over the next hour, uh, we're here to talk about the concept of trade disrupted. Within the context of this year's theme for the Brussels Forum, a world disrupted, one of the things that has been the most disruptive over the last year or so, and potentially for the future, is the trade dynamics. Uh, in particular, with the specter of a trade war between China and the United States, we now live in a world where uh, even big superpowers uh, can have a huge impact on the future of thousands of people's lives. And allies as well are facing trade tensions as well. Big questions remain about the future of organizations like the World Trade Organization. And of course, I haven't mentioned the new landscape that the digitization is going to be bringing with uh, the upending of millions of people's of jobs that are going to be changed and digital trade policy that uh, we should be looking at in the years to come. So without further ado, let me introduce my illustrious guests. Um, we have here on my left, Ambassador Dennis Shea, who is the Deputy uh, Trade Representative of the United States and the Chief of the Mission to the World Trade Organization in Geneva. On my right, Sabina Vayans, who's a figure many of you here in Brussels will recognize. Fresh from the Brexit Task Force, I believe this is your first uh, public appearance as Director General for Trade of the EU Commission, obviously uh, taking on the helm of that in almost brief at a very interesting time, both transatlantically and uh, as a Brit uh, across the channel as well, I should say, with Brexit on the cards too. And Victoria Espinel, who is president and CEO, uh, CEO of the BSA Software Alliance, somebody who many people in this room may also recognize as a 10-year veteran of the White House, having served both Republican and Democratic administrations, and you were a trade representative and negotiator yourself for intellectual property. Um, so we have a very balanced panel here to talk about these key issues. I will try and bring in the audience as soon as possible. I urge you also to tweet me questions as well while we continue our discussions. Um, Ambassador Shea, I presume that the first question probably should be coming towards you. Why do I... S <laughs> why <aren't> I <laughs> because your surprised? president will be speaking in Osaka uh, in about 24 hours uh, to potentially diffuse one of the most uh, tense mm. trade wars that we've seen in the best part of 70 years. Mm. When we're talking about trade disrupted, a world disrupted. Obviously, the United States has played the biggest role in this over the last year. What's the end game? Why? What's the strategy? Well, do I get to stand up and, and walk around so I can be like a professor here? <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a tough grader, so uh, right. folks should know that, no. Um, well, yes, I, like, like everyone else, I am waiting to see what the results of tomorrow's discussion between President Trump and uh, President Xi will be. But uh, you should understand that the 301 action uh, that the United States took against China should be put in context. I mean, this, it follows years, if not decades, of discussions, bilateral engagement with China over U.S. concerns about unfair trade practices and industrial policies that are trade distorting. Uh, we've had the JCCT, the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, all sorts of different configurations about how to deal with these, these issues. And in some instances, we got some good commitments, but they were not, not followed through. We've also worked at the WTO. We've brought, I think, 23 cases through the dispute settlement system against China, but we're not achieving the results uh, that we want. So uh, it's important. I'm going to be like everybody else, tuned into the TV, tuned in on the internet to see what, what the results of the discussion tomorrow are. But I think it's very important to understand the context in which the 301 action that you called uh, trade disruptive uh, was taken. It's not just China, though. It's also the European Union sure. that the United States is having a beef with. So it's fighting on both fronts. Well, yeah, we have, uh, we have some concerns with the European Union. There, we are discussing these concerns. I've been in some of those meetings with our European friends. Uh, so, uh, but we are also working together. The European Union and the United States and Japan are working together to deal with the challenges of non-market economies through the trilateral process. So one of the problems that we saw was the fact that there were a lack, there's an absence of rules around industrial subsidies, state enterprises, forced technology transfer. So we are now in working with the EU, Japan, 
uh, to come up with rules uh, around those issues. Uh, and they're, they're, they're based upon the challenges that non -market e a non-market economy like China has posed. It's Sabina Vind, obviously you've taken on the mantle of this job. Uh, just at the time when all of this is coming to a head, we've got the transatlantic uh, airplane dispute and the retaliatory measures uh, hanging over the EU's head and vice versa. What do you want to bring to this job? Will you be conciliatory? Will you be combative? <laughs> Um, I think you have to choose what you're doing depending on what the challenge is. And I think the challenge we have is to go back to the title of the session, not just trade disrupted, but it's actually the global order as we know it hanging by a thread. And I think that's what we see when we look at what's happening in Osaka. Beyond bilateral meetings, if you look at the difficulties of getting to an agreement on the key challenges facing the planet from climate change to international trade, you see where the problem is. I think what is new is, uh, in recent times, and that will have to then uh, fashion our response to it, is that we have an increasing interlinkage between the geopolitical and the economic. So actually, when we're talking about a trade war or trade tensions, what we are looking at is a uh, rivalry uh, for global leadership in technology and in security, which is carried out by the means of trade policy. So. What is the response to that? That is very difficult for the EU um, because European integration has rested on a separation between the geopolitical and the economic. We have to up our game. So it's not a matter of being conciliatory um, or uh, combative. It's a matter of being assertive. Um, I think we now live in a world where we have to define what is the system in which we want to live. So we have to up our game. We have a double strategy with the US. We have a positive agenda. It's the largest economic relationship. Uh, the US is a key pillar, has to be a key pillar of any uh, international order. But at the same time, we cannot be drawn into managed trade. Uh, EU prosperity and security rest on open trade and investment relations, and we have to defend those. And that is why we agree with a lot of what uh, Dennis said, what the US is saying, about uh, the challenges we face, about the challenge of integrating China into the world trading system. But we also see that the, uh, the US has been able to use the WTO to good effect because they've won close to 90% of the cases you've launched. So we just need to update the WTO rulebook. And uh, for the EU, it's neither being conciliatory nor uh, combative, but assertive. And I think as EU, we cannot be a lamb in a world of carnivores. Many hundreds of millions of lambs in that world, though, <laughs> and potential customers. Um, we'll get to the issue of uh, the WTO system and the appellate uh, judges and so mm. on and so forth and the necessity to appoint them later on this year. Um, but I just want to home in on one issue that you mentioned, this idea of whether or not you unbundle issues when doing future trade negotiations. What's your thought on that? Sorry, I'm not sure of, what of, you mean by of, unbundling. Of, of biting off more than you can chew ah. rather than being focused. Mm. Um, I don't know what you, you base that assertion on. Um, what we are saying, I mean, for us, what is essential is a rules-based trading system. Now, the center of that has to be the WTO, and it is in need of reform. On the analysis of the reform needs of the WTO, we are quite aligned with the US, actually. Where we disagree is on the concrete means of you know, encouraging people to come on board for the necessary reforms. But at the same time, our bilateral agenda, whether that is with Canada or Japan or Mercosur, we are currently in the last stretch of the negotiations, we hope, that also contributes to building building blocks for a rules-based international order. But so you cannot segment that. And uh, we also have to make sure that these agreements are acceptable for the general public. That's what I was coming to. But on the ground, politically speaking, those weren't easy sells to the average electorate. No, that is true. But what we have also seen is that uh, given the threats to the global order, a world disrupted, uh, actually, I think this has reinforced public support uh, for trade policy, while at the same time, we have been very attentive in the EU and in the Commission to being more transparent in what we are trying to do, and also strengthening the values base that is reflected in our trade agreements. And that is the challenge, and that, that's, that's only a way we can 
uh, go forward on. There's so many issues I'd like to discuss with you both in a second, not least uh, potential cooperation between the EU, the United States and Japan is another sort of front for uh, reviving the wish for international trade, or, uh, trade deals. But Victoria, I want to come to you and talk about the sort of future digitization. This is an area that some people say is not being given as much attention to because obviously the future will not necessarily be tariffs on aluminium, steel and cars. It'll be on data and trade. Um, so I, I think the future is what we need to look to. Um, so let's talk a little bit about data. You know, technology is, is a great disruptor. And one of the, one of the impetus of that is the dramatic increase in the amount of data that's being created. In fact, if you look at the amount of data that's being created, the amount is doubling every other year. Um, to give that some context, there's an estimate that by next year, there will be 44 zettabytes of data in the world, that is as many bits of data as there are stars in the observable universe. So it is, uh, it is an exponential increase. We already see the impact that it's having on the global economy, and we see the impact that it's having in society. It is you know, the increasing use of all kinds of emerging technology from data analytics, artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud computing, but we also see the impact that it has on our day-to-day -day lives and how we live them. And that change in our society and that change in our economy or it's going to have consequences, not just for the trade agenda, that is one important thing, um, but, for, uh, but for this sort of the, the international legal regime in general. So, you know, I guess one thing that I would say is I, I personally reject the premise um, that the world is going to move away from integration. That's not to say them unaware of the tensions that exist at this moment, but I think if you, if you look at the arc of human history and human experience, I think the world moves towards integration. And so I think one of the things that's really important for us all collectively is to keep our eye on the long game I think that is, that is where the world will continue to move. And I think as the economy becomes more integrated, and I think that is both inevitable and positive, even if, this, even if there are a lot of tensions at this moment, I think that is inevitable. I think it is positive. And I think what that will mean is that the international legal system is also going to need to move towards being more integrated or more consistent. I think short term, you know, I think there are a couple of things that we need to do. I think one of those is to reject um, the notion of a sort of zero sum economic mentality. But I think uh, another thing sort of picking up on something you said is also to see whether or not we can focus on kind of specific issues or specific areas where we can try to drive towards consensus. And we're not going to be able to solve every problem at the same time, but I think there, there may be some things, even things that people would find surprising in this room, where we could drive towards consensus. And I think that needs to be our long-term objective overall, is driving towards that international consensus. This is a particular hot topic in your sector, because obviously people sometimes use the cover of privacy issues as a non-tariff barrier, right? It's, it's, it's a barrier to, to, to being able to trade, some people in the digital area might argue. So I would actually say, and I think this may be surprising to people in this room, I think privacy is one of those areas where we could actually drive towards international consensus in the relative short term. And I realize that there's a view that there are vastly different um, notions and concepts of privacy, and that's, that's not untrue, but I also personally am of the view that that is an area where, you know, maybe it's a five or ten year time horizon, but in the relative short term, certainly compared to, you know, the arc of human history, that is an area where I think we can drive towards international consensus. I think there's a focus on it um, in a way, in a positive way that there hasn't been before, and I, I would say that is one of the areas where I think the governments of the world should be actively collaborating to see whether or not we can come to maybe not identical systems, but sort of interoperable, largely consistent areas of consensus. Sabina Wehr, would you like to respond to that? Because obviously the EU has done so much work on this yeah. subject. No, I would tend to agree with that, a more positive outlook. I think the uh, divergences are exaggerated. They are real. And uh, if I want to simplify it, uh, we have a system, you know, the question is who owns the data? And we have different concepts here. And I think in the US, it's uh, private, privately owned by companies. 
In China, it tends to be state-owned. And I think Europe has developed a system where it is the individual that owns the data. Now, we have to bring these different approaches together. And we have an opportunity with the ongoing e-commerce negotiations in Geneva. Um, there are also interesting initiatives like the Japanese initiative uh, on uh, uh, data-free uh, uh, flow with trust. And I think that is what we need to build on. And that shows also, I think, if we can manage that in Geneva, in, in the e-commerce negotiations, I think that will show the relevance of the WTO for the 21st century. And uh, we have to update the rules so that they are fit uh, for purpose. Out of all of those systems, is there one that you think might become the prevailing one? I wouldn't want to prejudge that. I don't think you should go into a negotiation uh, with uh, one party predefining the outcome. Um, I think we have approaches which are interesting. We see that uh, the EU approach with the GDPR is actually getting some traction, which is not surprising given that it is applied in a market of 500 uh, million uh, uh, people. Um, but, you know, we will have to see what we can work with. And as I said, there are interesting initiatives uh, elsewhere with which we want to engage. Ambassador Shea, obviously your country uh, at the moment is focused on um, issues like aluminium, steel tariffs, potential tariffs for cars, so on and so forth, arguments like national security. But data is also the future, isn't it? Sure. Digitization. So uh, some of... The, US detractor, the US's detractors may argue that you're looking back, not forwards. Well, let me just talk about di digital trade because there is a, probably the most ambitious digital trade chapter in the renegotiated NAFTA, now called the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement, the USMCA. So we have taken what we've done there and brought it to the WTO, and we're very active participants in the digital trade initiative or e-commerce initiative at plurilateral initiative at the, at the WTO. And our, our goals are to achieve a high ambition, commercially meaningful agreement uh, that's enforceable and with obligations, that, with all participants assuming the same obligations. That's our goal. And when we mean by high ambition, we mean uh, we want to prohibit data localization requirements. We want to ensure this free flow of data across borders that promotes trade. So I had actually attended uh, a couple of the sessions last week, and it was very interesting. I, I, I told, it's being led by Australia, Japan, and Singapore. And uh, I, I told my colleague from Australia, who's sort of one of the leaders of the effort, I said, this was the most interesting, uh, one of the more interesting conversations I've heard in Geneva, because instead of people reading uh, talking points and speeches to each other. There was actual interactivity. There was discussion about the various proposals put on the table. So um, I, I was very impressed by the conversation uh, that took place. But I think we have a long way to go. Uh, you know, countries like China have said that uh, data localization uh, prohibitions are off the table. Uh, they're very, they want to restrict uh, cross-border uh, data transfer. Uh, they're, they're very concerned about internet sovereignty. So to square that approach with the approach I think we share in many respects with the EU, Japan, and others is going to be potentially difficult. But we'll see how it goes. So what about this closer focus between the EU, Japan, and the United States, putting aside the kind of differences that obviously your countries have um, in the immediate with trade? How will that relationship shape up, and how much more commitment will you stick to it? Um, I mean, this is an essential part of, uh, you know, working together bilaterally or with groups of countries uh, which share a common objective. And I think we have a, quite a big common agenda uh, with the US and Japan, and we need to drive that forward. And I think this is something which we would then have, because it helps to develop, that you cannot develop uh, rules immediately uh, with 164 members in the WTO. So you have to, you know predetermined something, but then obviously we would like to involve others into that. So we hope that we can in the next few uh, months move forward decisively, especially on disciplines on industrial subsidies, but also forced technology transfer. So I think this is a key uh, building block for a rules-based system. Is the WTO still relevant today? 
Absolutely. And I was encouraged to hear from uh, Ambassador Shea that uh, uh, they want to have an agreement which is enforceable. So that means that we have to make sure that the WTO dispute settlement system is up and running and can actually help to enforce rules. Mm. There's my segue. Well, right. <laughs> so it's your country that's blocking the appellate judges in the WTO, and you have till December to name them. Well, have folks heard about the appellate body? You, okay, you're familiar. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the U.S. position is incredibly, is, is clear and very straightforward, in our view, you know, should not be controversial, is that if we, if the WTO is supposed to be a rules-based organization, then the appellate body needs to follow the rules, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what does that mean? It means the appellate body should issue its rulings within 90 days. It means the appellate body should not appoint its own members. That's up to the membership to appoint appellate body members. The appellate body should not insist uh, that its rulings are precedent, binding precedent. Uh, the appellate body should not engage in fact-finding. Uh, the appellate body should not be issuing advisory opinions that are unrelated to resolving a dispute. And the appellate body shouldn't be adding rights and obligations to members that are not in the agreements. And that's the position we've been taking. Uh, we've been making these points uh, not for 16 weeks or months, but 16 years. And um, fortunately, some other members are beginning to understand the U.S. position and appreciating the U.S. position. Uh, I have to say, at the last General Council meeting, I was perplexed that the EU said that you, they do not share our underlying concerns about the appellate body. Uh, that is, is very perplexing. We think the words are very, very clear in the dispute settlement understanding, what they mean, and uh, you know, just jiggling around with new words. If the old words aren't clear, which they are, then you know, coming up with new words won't necessarily make a difference. You say you've got a few countries on your side, but it's 160 something countries. Uh, Sabina Bay, and you're used to dealing with, you know, okay, smaller number of countries, 20 odd countries. But still, getting everybody on the same page is going to be difficult, and that's a long list of concessions you're demanding. So I'm not, the I'm, middle, those aren't concessions. Middle, no, no, um, Nina, you ha those are not concessions. That's what we negotiated. Okay. This is the, what the agreement says. The agreement says, decide cases within 60 days, but in no event longer than 90 days. The, beginning in 2011, the appellate body basically decided not to forego that rule. 43 of the 47 cases appeals decided since 2011 have been outside the 90-day rule. The appellate body is engaged in fact-finding, but the rules say it should be limited, their actions should be limited to legal review of the panel decisions. So these aren't concessions. We're saying follow the rules. This is a rules-based organization, so follow the rules. And if indeed this argument is made that the WTO isn't fit for purpose, where does the WTO go from here? Oh, well, that's why we have to work through these issues. And how, do, how do you think you're going to work through these well, issues between now and December, that's six months? That is exactly the problem. Uh, we have made uh, proposals uh, already last year uh, trying to address these challenges. On a lot of the analysis, we do agree. But where we have a fundamental difference is uh, the assessment to what extent the appellate body has uh, gone beyond its remit. Yeah, that is a difference of appreciation, which, however, should not stand in the way of necessary reforms. And let's be clear, the reform agenda of the WTO is broader than just the appellate body system or the dispute settlement system. We also need to look at the general functioning because people are not notifying what they are supposed to notify. Uh, so we need to uh, look at the negotiating function and revive that. For all that, we have made proposals. Now, as regards this appellate body crisis, because the problem is, of course, the, the risk we face is that on the 11th of December, the system will stop functioning because there are no three judges uh, ava arbitrators available anymore. So we have also started to say, while we are engaged in this reform process uh, and these discussions on which we are really also trying to engage uh, as much as we can with the US in order to address their concerns, we also have to look at the stopgap solution uh, that protects uh, uh, members' rights uh, in December 2019. And here we are looking at what we call an interim solution, where we are looking at mirroring uh, the functioning of the appellate body uh, system. We are not creating a separate system. 
But what we are doing is we are looking at using possibilities in the dispute settlement understanding of the WTO, where two members of the WTO can agree amongst themselves to uh, apply arbitration procedures. That is not a long-term solution, it's not a structural solution, it's a stopgap solution, which at least allows people uh, to uh, rely on the WTO to enforce rights yeah, and give us the time to work out the structural solution, rather than encouraging people to try and resort to unilateral measures, which very quickly, as we are currently seeing, spiral down uh, into trade uh, tensions or trade war. I'm not a fan of the expression trade war. I prefer trade tensions, although they are pretty pretty hostile. And not to mention the perplexity with which other developing economies will be watching this pan out yeah. on a unilateral level. Um, Victoria, is the WTO fit for purpose in today's digital age? Will it be fit for purpose if it stays as it is five years, ten years from now? So, um, I was thinking about the phrase fit for purpose because you used it earlier. I mean, I think the WTO is an enormously important institution um, that should be supported by the governments that are in it. You know, I think like any institution, it's it's not perfect, and so you know, I think the reform initiatives um, generally. I, I think every institution should be taking a look at itself once it's existed for more than a few years and seeing whether or not it needs to be adjusted. But you know, I think the WTO is important not just ju just in its function of for example, solving WTO disputes, but also as kind of a really important part of a general rules-based system. So I think it is important for its geopolitical implications as, as, as equally as for the sort of trade and economic function that it has. Um, I think the going to kind of the future of the WTO, what it needs to be looking at, I would, I would highly associate myself with the remarks um, of both Ambassador O'Shea and um, to mean that the e-commerce initiative that the WTO has, I think, is really positive. Um, we'll see how far it can go, but it's really encouraging to see that the United States, the European Union, and others are, are highly engaged in having candid you know, true, candid, and hopefully eventually productive discussions coming out of that, because those are the kinds of issues that the WTO is going to need to increasingly focus on if it's going to remain relevant to the global economy. Let's start taking questions. We've got half an hour. Um, I've been checking on Twitter, and a few of you in the audience have been a bit shy. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, th this is one of the biggest issues of our day. Let's take a question from you, sir, in the front row. Obviously, I'd ask uh, all of our um, participants to clearly identify themselves and keep their questions as questions rather than statements. <laughs> When I was ambassador to Germany, I was very involved in the TTIP negotiations. And I guess my question vis-a-vis -vis Europe is, um, what are the chapters that are now, um, have been identified for this sort of new EU-US uh, free trade agreement? Uh, the Trump-Juncker Kumbaya meeting suggested, you know, industrial products, automobiles, and maybe some regulatory convergence. But beyond that, and in particular, how on earth can we negotiate an agreement that does not include agriculture? Uh, and, uh, I, you know, the ambassador is well aware of the political challenge of that in the United States. And my understanding is that the EU has said uh, no agriculture. That's my question. Thanks. Well, I totally agree with you on <laughs> agriculture. Um, I mean, I, I was listening. My boss, Bob Lighthizer, testified before the... Uh, Senate Finance Committee uh, in Congress last week, and uh, Chuck Grassley, who's the chairman of the Senate uh, Finance Committee uh, from Iowa, who's a farmer, uh, he said if uh, th there can be no agreement unless agriculture is on the table. So that's the political reality in the United States. So, uh, but we are talking about other issues, and I'll maybe you would yeah. like to, Sabine, talk yeah. about that. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, Look, I mean, we have to draw some lessons from the TTIP experience. We cannot pretend that we have not tried. Uh, we didn't succeed. Um, so we need to look at how can we move forward. Um, we will, on either side, we do not have uh, the conditions in place to have a fully-fledged free trade agreement covering essentially all trade. Um, we have an agreement uh, between the two presidents uh, on a certain agenda. We are committed to taking that forward. We are ready to engage on this, and we hope that we can build trust in this process by delivering certain elements of it. 
and uh, you already referred to conformity assessment, regulatory cooperation. Again, this links to the theme of our, our session here today, which is the global competition for who sets the standards for the 21st century. We have an interest there as EU and US to work together. Um, but you say agriculture, we say public procurement. And the US yeah. has uh, explained that uh, the Jones Act, the Buy America Act, is off limits. Under these conditions, and also given that, uh, and here I come to the political conditionality in the EU in order to get uh, free trade agreements approved, we have a clear conditionality linked to the Paris Climate Agreement. Yeah. Well, that is not where the US is at the moment. So these are the constraints in which we work. And we have to build a positive agenda and deliver on that, that takes into account these constraints. Maybe we will be able to do something more comprehensive uh, in the future, but I think the main thing now is to build the trust by delivering at least on some issues, uh, rather than remain blocked and have the disputes, which we also have and which we have to manage, uh, hang over the whole relationship. Um, Sabine Van, can I just can I add yes. on to that? Mm -hmm. um, so understanding the political complications that exist, but I, I would just like to put another issue um, in the mix. There's agriculture, there's procurement, there is digital trade, one of the topics mm -hmm. that we're talking about today. And you know, the US has been a real leader on digital trade. The, the provisions of the USMCA that um, Dennis referred to earlier are, I think, groundbreaking. Japan, as you've mentioned, Prime Minister Abe has been very focused on digital trade. Whether through the mechanism of a trade agreement, which is one mechanism but not the only mechanism, or something else, I think having the United States and Europe, which has done so much thinking on privacy but has been the less overtly active on digital trade, having the United States and Europe come together to work on digital trade, I think it would be not only enormously beneficial but also honestly seems like kind of a non it seems like a seems like a absolute no-brainer given the importance um, to the global economies of both so I guess this is more of a request than a question um, but I'll take this opportunity <laughs> to publicly request that the United States and Europe um, partner together on digital trade I think it would be uh, it makes sense for all of us and be enormously beneficial is it something you commit to well I mean we're working in the in the context of the plurilateral yeah. in, uh, in Geneva at the WTO, I'm listening to uh, my U uh, European Union colleague make his points, and uh, he's listening to us make our points. So, uh, and we, we, you know, we'll see how this process unfolds mm. in, unfolds in, G in Geneva. Yeah. Can I just pick up um, before what we were talking about when the discussion veered towards climate change? Now, any future trading agreement really has to acknowledge the increasing demand, especially among the younger yeah. generation, to combat climate change. How much of a big part of future all-encompassing trade policies is this going to be? Mm. I mean, we have already progressively uh, moved towards reinforcing uh, um, the link between trade and sustainable development in our trade agreements. And I think we have to build on that, especially as regards uh, climate change, climate action. Um, and uh, I think here we, we are looking at different elements. We should also not have the idea that trade can resolve the climate emergency. That's not going to happen. But we need to look at what is the impact of trade on the climate situation. And secondly, what are measures we can take in order to contribute to solving uh, the climate problem. So that is a reflection that is currently ongoing. Uh, and which I think the, will be very prominent on the agenda of uh, the next commission. Uh, it, is, uh, it features prominently also in the strategic agenda of the European Council. The European Parliament is very attached to that. And we need to look at, can we revive negotiations uh, on you know, environmental goods, uh, which uh, uh, failed in the WTO? Can we look at environmental services? Can we look at technology transfer agreements, etc., which would contribute uh, to climate action? Ambassador Shea, what yeah. kind of partner is the US well, going to be in this? I, I want to pivot a little bit to another sort of environmentally related issue, which is front and center at the WTO, and that's the depletion of the world's oceans. Yes. Uh, fish as a result of subsidies. And this is the only multilateral negotiation going on at the WTO today. Okay, and we are required, pursuant to our minister, ministerial directive, to have a negotiated outcome uh, by, the end, by the end of this year. And the U.S. has been very active on this issue. We've submitted proposals to prohibit subsidies for illegal fishing, 
prohibit subsidies for high seas fishing. Uh, we've proposed a cap proposal uh, for subsidies that contribute to overcapacity in fishing. So the U.S. has been a leader in fighting for an ambitious agreement, which we're supposed to get done by the end of this year. And I'm just mentioning this because I have said before, and I, I'm borrowing it from a, Ambassador Zapata, who's from Mexico, who's leading this effort at the WTO. Uh, it's not just that the uh, WTO is going to save the fish. Mm. It's the fish are going to save the WTO. Because if we don't have a negotiated outcome on this by the end of the year, <coughs> it'll be a major black eye for the WTO as a negotiating organization. That may be a noble project, but it's not the all-encompassing green climate change initiative that future members of the electorate will be looking for in these trade negotiations, in any future trade deal that they feel they could, they could believe in? Well, we have a democratic process in the United States. And those voters will put pressure on our leaders to, uh, if, if they want to see that in trade agreements. Let's take some more questions. I believe we have a question here, and then we'll take your question as well, sir. Simon Fraser from Flint Global. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about the types, the mechanisms of trade negotiation that you think are most effective these days. In my country, which is the UK, we're having a very simplistic debate about free trade agreements at the moment and the potential benefits that they will bring to our economy after Brexit. On the other hand, multilateral global trade negotiations seem to be non-productive these days, they're so slow. I was involved in negotiating the Doha round and we didn't get anywhere. There's increasing talk today about plurilateral agreements and normative agreements rather than rule setting agreements, for example, in new areas like digital. So what, is the, what are the most effective mechanisms looking forward that you foresee for actually delivering results that have an impact with a sufficient international scale to actually take forward some sort of multilateral system, even if it's not within the formal WTO uh, all-embracing um, format? Um, I think we need, uh, first of all, the priority for the EU remains the multilateral trading system. Now, with the difficulties that you have lived through yourself, I think we need to use more and more the flexibilities that we have in the WTO, and that is the plurilateral route. Now, there we have to see what our agreements, uh, 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 I mean, the, the, we want to, to have a form of open plurilateralism, where you start with those who are carrying an issue, but you keep it open for others to join. And obviously, depending on the subject of the negotiations, you need to have a critical mass of participants. Yeah? Take a digital trade agreement in the WTO. Would that really make sense without China? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Then the question is, what is the flexibility we need also in terms of contents of an agreement? Because obviously with the plurilateral, if you apply it to everyone, which you have to do when you're talking about tariffs, you have a free rider problem. Yeah? In a normative negotiation, that is less the case. But still, you have to deal with that free rider problem in a plurilateral context. So the question is, what is the balance you strike between trying to have a critical mass of people on board, and what is the price you may be willing to pay in terms of differentiation in commitments between participants in order to have a foundational basis that brings as many people on board as possible. So I think we need to be creative in the way we work with plurilateral agreements in the WTO. That for me is, is the way forward there. But uh, that should not be to the detriment of uh, multilateral negotiations where they are possible. Now, in terms of the uh, bilateral negotiations, I mean, um, they, they can be building blocks for a rules-based system, but they are clearly a second best in this respect. They work best between uh, uh, countries uh, which have a complementary economic structure, so you need to look at whether it makes sense economically, but also whether on the normative side of it there is a convergence of views, and then it can be helpful. Um, what is also quite clear is that uh, size matters in trade negotiations. Uh, so one should not have illusions about what you can do as an individual country in the world of today. 
Ambassador Shea? Uh, I think all of the above was my initial answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, multilateralism, plurilateralism, bilateral arrangements, at times unilateral action if necessary. I mean, at the, uh, at the, at the, at the WTO, there's the consensus principle. Mm. So nothing gets done unless all 164 members agree. So you can imagine how difficult, as you know, you know this, but you can imagine how difficult that is to, 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 reach, to reach agreement, to get unanimity, essentially, among a very diverse, diverse membership. So I, I agree. I mean, the U.S. is very active uh, in the di digital trade, plurilateral. We, su we support that. Uh, we have gone out uh, and renegotiated uh, the course, Korea-U.S. trade agreement. We've uh, renegotiated NAFTA. Uh, we are in trade negotiations with uh, the EU and with Japan, and we've laid the groundwork for uh, a trade agreement with the United Kingdom once the UK lives, leaves the, uh, the EU. So I guess the, I'll go back to my initial thought, all of the above, all of these approaches make some, make some sense in certain, you know, depending upon the situation. Victoria, can I ask you to answer Sabina Vayan's perhaps rhetorical question, <laughs> if you forgive me, um, about whether or not it would make sense to have a digital trade talks at the WTO without China? Uh, what do you think? Yes. So, uh, and, and, and why? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer not just with respect to China, but more generally. So I, no. I thought you did an admirable job of summing up the, the balance between trying to bring in as many countries as once and then the compromises that are inevitably involved in doing that. And so I would say, you know, my own personal view is that it is probably, it is better to start with a smaller number of countries and at, aim for a higher standard than to start very, very broad at a lower standard. I see the pros and cons of both. I think it's also more feasible. So just from a practical point of view, as well as from a sort of philosophical point of view, I think that's what makes sense. And so I think that is, that's, so therefore, to your question, I think it would make sense to start with agreements that maybe didn't include every country, every economy in the world, even major economies that were at a higher standard, if it's possible to find consensus in those areas. Um, didn't we start the TTIP that, that way? So um, I think the other thing I would say, though, is, and I, I alluded to this before, like trade agreements being an important mechanism, but not the only mechanism. And I think that may be particularly true in some of the normative areas, mm -hmm. as you said. So I think, I, think, I think we, I think, you know, the U.S. and Europe, I think governments generally should be looking to see whether or not there are other areas outside of trade agreements. And I want to emphasize, I think trade agreements are an incredibly important mechanism, but are there other areas outside of the trade agreement mechanism where they can be working together to find consensus on normative rules, such as, for example, privacy? Let's take a few more questions from the audience. Um, gentlemen there, and I'll also take your question in a minute, sir. I'll be taking, let's take about two or three questions in one go, and then we can. Thank you very much. Emre Pekar with the Wall Street Journal. A question to uh, Sabine and Ambassador Shea. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, since uh, Ambassador Lighthizer uh, outlined this staged approach, and given the gridlock over agriculture and Congress's opposition to consider anything that doesn't have agriculture, would it be possible uh, to start talks on industrial goods, get that under your belt, but not move towards ratification and engage maybe perhaps with another July statement like agreement on the next step to build towards a greater agreement uh, that includes public procurement and agriculture and the two sides are both happy. Is this something under discussions? And a second question, if I may, on the WTO. Um, the EU is now trying to build this coalition of the willing use uh, with Article 25 and keep the appellate body system alive to an extent. Uh, the non-functioning of the appellate body would effectively take us back to the GATT days where you have a panel ruling and then it's up to the parties to decide whether or not to implement that. Um, are you not concerned that you're effectively splitting the WTO in two, one in the EU model where you have the appellate body, one in the US model, uh, which Ambassador Lighthizer seems to be a fan of, which is the GATT system with uh, no appeals uh, process? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take your question. Uh, 
Cameron, former European Commission. Um, Sabine said that size matters in international trade, which could be interpreted as a reference to the UK, who knows. But um, do you, uh, Trump, when he was in the UK last month, said a uh, deal with the UK could be done quickly and easily. Is this a view shared by USTR, and how far are you in preparations? And for Sabine, you said you wanted to see a more assertive EU policy, which implies a more holistic approach encompassing other areas. Could you say a little bit more about how you see that? Okay, thank you. Let's, let's start by taking those questions. Um, Ambassador Shea. I, I will say um, we, President Trump obviously is very eager to uh, have uh, a phenomenal trade agreement with the UK once it exits the UK. There have been a lot of discussions um, between USTR folks and people in the U International Trade uh, Ministry of, of the UK. So I think once the UK is in a position uh, to to enter into a free trade agreement, I think there's a lot of political will on the part of the United States to get that achieved. So that's, that's where I'll, I'll leave that. Can, can and, I just quickly sure. interject there? Sorry, Ambassador Shea. Political will in the UK, though, could be distorted by the fact that your own ambassador to London has said the NHS should be on the cards, all sorts of issues that are emotive issues for British citizens who voted yeah. for Brexit, um, may not necessarily share his point of view on. Well, I, Are those I'm, on the cards? I, I am not in the weeds on this issue. So, uh, but I will say that there is tremendous political will in the administration as well as in Congress to, to have a U.S.-U.K. free trade agreement. So how that gets worked out, we shall see. And we shall see whether the, when the U.K. gets out of the uh, EU. Now, re with respect to your question, I mean, what, Pre what Ambassador Lighthizer is saying is, I want the appellate body to follow the rules. Okay, we've laid out in extremely detailed interventions at, at the WTO each of our concerns. And together, you could put these, these they're like chapters of a book uh, that you could put together. And we, f we feel the language of the dispute settlement agreement is very clear. What's unclear about 90 days? What's unclear about limiting your appeals to the legal conclusions? You know, what's, what's unclear about this? And uh, so that's where we come from. We want the appellate body to follow the rules that we all agree to, if in fact we're a rules-based organization. It's been event. Um, on uh, the uh, EU-US negotiations, um, we are impatient to get started uh, on the negotiations on industrial tariffs, but also conformity assessment and regulatory standards. And hopefully that could create a dynamic on which we can then build for the future. Now, I don't want to go now down the rabbit hole of, you know, what would be the procedure for ratification of an agreement of which we don't even see the contours yet. Uh, but from our point of view, it is impo important to create positive momentum. I think we've started doing that. We are working together on LNG. We have a good story to tell on soybeans. Uh, we have uh, uh, um, now made the proposal on uh, high-quality beef, etc. So there are things where we are moving forward, but we need to have traction for a wider agenda. So that is what we need to create. And obviously, that also requires that we get a handle on the conflicts we have, like Airbus Boeing, you know, where you know, we should avoid going into a, a spiral of, of, of sanctions, which just hurt both sides. Uh, so I think that is the challenge we have there. On the WTO, I think the challenge is now to move from the complaints to the solutions, to practical solutions. And we are ready, as I said, we are ready and we have made proposals to address uh, 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 what we see also as problems with the functioning of the system as it is at the moment. But, but the question was actually about creating a two-tier system, wasn't it, where people are yes. acting in silos. And it does sound as though there is some divergence on a number of the issues that you've discussed over yeah. the last 45 minutes. No. Thank you very much uh, for reminding me of that, because we are not doing a two-tier system. This is not a system that we are talking about. What we are talking about is a stopgap solution of bilateral administrative arrangements between WTO members, which can either be just about a precise dispute that is already there, or two parties can agree that in current and future disputes, they will apply these rulings. That is based 
that is based on the current rules of the dispute settlement understanding, but it is clearly not an alternative uh, to uh, uh, keeping the, the, the appellate body system, the dispute settlement uh, system up and running. So it's not a parallel system because it is, a, it is at best a network of bilateral uh, uh, agreements. So uh, that's what I wanted to say on that. And then there was a third question, uh, which was... The assertive EU, exactly. I think we need to, and that will be very challenging for the EU because we are not set up for that, we've not been set up for that, we need to integrate much more our uh, diplomatic tools and our external economic relations tools. We, I don't want to talk just about trade policy, I want to talk about the external projection of the internal market in all its dimensions. And that, I think, is what the next college will have to do. We will have to find a way to integrate what are we doing externally in, in, uh, in, in regulatory area, in financial services. Uh, we need to look at our sanctions policy. I mean, this is a huge challenge, but, you know, nothing better than external pressure to uh, deliver on something that has eluded us for quite a while. But with uh, the world disrupted and... Uh, the multilateral system hanging by a thread, I think that should be enough of an incentive uh, to get going. Well, just briefly, um, sorry, I've got to put my journalist hat on because the opportunities arise. Fraser Cameron mentioned the subject of Brexit. You're obviously fresh off the beat of the Brexit <laughs> task force and now you have this bigger role in international trade. It's getting very close to a no-deal scenario. So we're here talking about the benefits of multilateral trade deals, but the UK is heading towards the end of the cliff. In your new role, where do you see that and what's your latest political message to those who are fighting to be leader of the Conservative Party on the subject of Brexit? I think the best service I can do to the debate in the UK is not to try and address messages. Uh, I think that would uh, be inappropriate and not well received. What I can say is that the EU and the UK have a strong interest in finding a new accommodation uh, once the UK has left uh, the EU. Um, we, are, we will remain aligned on the outlook on the world. Uh, I think uh, the EU and the UK will be partners for a rules-based international trading system. And we have every interest in getting off to a good start. Now, no deal would not be a good start uh, to building that future constructive relationship. But, you know, uh, the choice will be the UK's, um, and uh, we are ready to engage. Right, let's take a few more questions. I'm going to move over to this side of the room. I'll take questions from you two gentlemen. Thank you. <clears throat> Danny Gross again. I want to come back to uh, the great disruption and the influence of China about which we heard uh, this morning and the importance it has for the United States. And uh, one, if you want, small aspect of that is the anti-China clause which uh, the United States has been uh, pursuing and it has been able to get Canada to agree to a little known clause which says basically that if Canada ever were to even start negotiating a free trade agreement with a non-market economy, really China, then the United States would have the right to withdraw from that agreement. And as far as I know, the United States has a similar negotiation objective with both the UK and the EU. And that's where size matters. Um, so my question would be to Ambassador, are you set an important negotiating objective for both? And to Sabina, of course, would the EU ever accept such a clause? Let's, uh, let's ask you to take those and then we'll take the next question. We'll take the next question afterwards, actually. Oh. Thank, you, thank you very much. Hiro Akita, uh, Nikkei from Tokyo. Uh, again, my question is also to Ambassador Shia and uh, about the how to better deal with China. And you said that the US is talking with EU and Japan about how to deal with China. But uh, it looks like for me that US is putting a big gun on the back of EU and Japan, and that is an automobile tariff, and also smile and shake hand and let's cooperate together on the China front. So if China is the highest priority for US, why can't US just suspend, or well, not put down, but suspend the demand on the automobile tariff to EU and Japan, and put the higher priority to better cooperation with 
EU, Japan, US, and put the pressure on China to solve the issue if it is the highest priority. Because otherwise, uh, this big crack can, China can take advantage of this division. For example, in Beijing, I hear more discussion about the possible China's entry to a TPP, though Japan is skeptical about the possibility for China to fulfill. But it is, you know, if China start negotiation, maybe China can isolate US, maybe effectively. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, how, how do you think of this? Well, that's a lot to digest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, uh, I, I, you know, I work in Geneva. I work at the WTO, and I have a very good working relationship, I believe, with my Japanese and my EU, EU colleagues. I mean, we're working together. I've been a participant in some of the trilateral meetings, mm -hmm. so I have, have a window into that. And I, I don't see us forcing the EU and Japan to get into this trilateral arrangement to discuss ways to uh, expand the rule book to cover industrial subsidies, forced technology transfer, state enterprises, and other issues. I don't see us for, I think it's in, they see it as in their interest uh, to, to do this. So uh, I, I, I uh, don't agree with the premise of your question, the very, very graphic premise of guns to, to uh, but, uh, and again, at the, at the WTO, I, one thing that we are working closely on with the EU and Japan is a transparency proposal, which mm -hmm. is incredibly important to keep this inst yeah. the institution viable. Too many members signed on to notification mm -hmm. obligations yeah. and are not fulfilling them. So the United States, Japan, EU, and a collection of other countries are working together to encourage countries to fulfill their notification obligations and provide technical assistance, and if, but if they are willful and repeated violators, there has to be some sanction. So the point I'm, I'm raising that is that I have seen in my, where I sit, the EU, Japan, others, we have our issues, but we're able to compartmentalize them and work together and collaborative, collaboratively on other issues. Um. I, I tried to say that in the beginning. I mean, what we are trying to achieve is, first of all, we have to recognize that uh, the uh, economic model of China is an enormous challenge for the world, and that the WTO system at the moment does not have the necessary disciplines uh, to integrate China and create a level playing field that is essential for trade to, and investment to thrive. So. We need to update the rule book, and that's where we are working with the US and, and Japan, because this is not anti-China, this is pro-multilateral disciplines. And at the same time, if we succeed in that, we hope that that will also convince the US to stay in the multilateral trading system, because it provides for enforceable disciplines that are in, in the interest of everybody. So that's the way we are, we are uh, working. Um, I think we've been very clear in the past that we are uh, not really going to move under threat. Um, but uh, um, I'm not aware of uh, any of these demands uh, being presented to us. Uh, but I think um, we, we've said that we are not going to uh, negotiate under the threat of uh, unilateral uh, measures, and that applies across the board. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that we are not engaged in FTA negotiations with China uh, for a number of reasons, but we are engaged in negotiations on an investment agreement with China. And uh, that is also moving forward and is, again, another way of creating rules for the global economy. Now, I'm aware that we're out of time. Um, can I just ask Victoria a, a last question to you uh, from our two trade representatives from two of the biggest economic blocks anywhere in the world? As somebody who represents the digital industry, which is obviously the future, would you like to see uh, big countries focus on any specific areas over the next five to ten years? And perhaps, as, as you alluded to in your question, um, put aside their differences and focus on the real issue at hand, which, of course, is China's economic strategy. So I think, I think more cooperation between the United States and Europe and among all governments on digital trade issues like data localization is enormously important. So I said that before, I'll say it again. But here's another thing I think we need to start thinking about as we, as we look to the future and going to a world disrupted. We've talked some today about uh, existing tensions and we've talked about kind of the elements of the legal mechanisms underlying the current 
trade institutions. But I think when we, when we think about where the world is going and what technology is going to do to trade, and we think about what's going to happen to global supply chains because of technological disruption, you know, blockchain, additive manufacturing, or 3D printing, I mean, the whole trading system, I think, is going to look enormously different in 15 years than it does today. So while the, while the elements of the WTO institution are very important to think about and get right, and the trade tensions that we're facing today are real, the entire mechanics of how trade is actually conducted in the world are going to be in, un, upended. And I think the, the, the government officials that are focused on trade need to somehow both be focused on what's happening today, but also looking to the future and what kind of trading system, what kind of rules are we going to need in a world where trade is actually conducted in a way that is completely different than it's conducted today. Well, with that, I'd like to thank our guests, Ambassador Dennis Shea from the United States, also Sabina Vayand here from the European Commission, and uh, last but not least, Victoria Spinell from BSA and Software Alliance. Thank you very much to the audience. Please, of course, continue the discussion online and over the coffee break, which is about to begin now. Mm -hmm.